In this final segment on compensating wage differentials, we'll look at the equilibrium uh, condition and we'll look at what's referred to as an offer curve. And at the very end of the last segment on employer considerations, I gave you a glimpse into the equilibrium condition. So let's look at that. If we're thinking about equilibrium, we're thinking about where the indifference curve for the employee and the ISO profit curve for the firm are tangent to one another, the point at which they're equal. We know that we have a balance condition in microeconomics. We've seen this numerous times where our balance condition is really simply where the marginal utility of risk in this case divided by the price of risk is equal to the marginal utility of wage divided by the price of wage. Well, if you think about it, a worker and an employer really uh, have, have elements of each of these two terms, MU of risk over price of risk versus MU of wage over price of wage. And we know that in both cases that in competitive markets, uh, firms and workers are wage takers. Uh, they don't set the price of wage, and nor do they set the price of remediating or providing either one risk. But they do identify or change the marginal utilities of wage and the marginal utilities of risk. We know that uh, when we when we have earn more and more money, the additional utility we get from an additional dollar might go down and down. So the more we earn, the less each additional dollar might mean to us. So we have a downward relationship, a negative relationship in this marginal utility concept, such that the balance condition is one that we try to reach. I believe we've talked about this when we thought of marginal revenue product of labor divided by the price of labor, and, for, and then we thought about the marginal revenue product of capital divided by the price of capital in a prior segment. We try to reach this balance condition. Well, when we know that the, we know the balance condition leads to profit maximization. So it's a profit maximizing condition. Well, if we rewrite the balance condition, we can simply put all of the utility or marginal utilities into one term and put the prices into another term, such that the marginal utility of risk divided by the marginal utility of wage would then be equal to the price of risk divided by the price of wage. And all I did there was I divided both sides by the marginal utility of wage, so that eliminated it from the right-hand side of the original equation, placed it in the denominator of the left-hand part of, the, uh, of this equivalency, and then I multiplied both sides by the price of risk. And when I did so, that eliminated the price of risk from the left-hand uh, equation and put it in the numerator of the right-hand equation. So if, if I know that the balance condition is profit maximizing, then I also know that this reformation of it, this simple rewriting of it, is also profit maximizing. Well, I think we've already considered two other elements here. We've, already, we've thought about this in terms of risk and reward space, and we've, or risk and benefit space, uh, wage and benefit space, excuse me. Now we're going to think about this in wage and risk space again. Wage and risk. And we know that the marginal utility of risk divided mar by the marginal utility of wage is the worker's indifference curve. And we know that that is downward sloping, or rather upward sloping, and convex. This would be the indifference curve for the worker. And we similarly are aware that in this wage and risk space that the ISO profit curve for the firm is going to be upward sloping and concave. So if we have this scenario where we have an ISO profit of zero and a worker utility preference of U1, these are not tangent, and this worker will not choose to work for this firm. In order for this worker to choose to work for the firm, the firm would have to increase the wage or, or decrease the risk. Either one is going to bring this line into tangency, perhaps, with the worker's indifference curve. But to do that, this firm then would start to lose money, and they're not going to do that to take on a particular worker. They may, however, uh, be willing to take on a different kind of worker, and a worker that gets their utility level from some combination of risk and wage that can also be found on the firm's ISO profit curve. Now, this might be a different worker that's getting utility level one, or maybe it's the same worker, 
but who simply was willing to receive a lower utility level in order to get that job. So when we see that the indifference curve is tangent to the isoprofit curve, what we're really seeing is where workers and firms are meeting or matching and where the worker is accepting the firm's offer. Well, this is the formation of the uh, equilibrium in wage and risk space, and it's all built on this premise of marginal utility of risk equally marginal wa utility of wage, which is simply the indifference curve being equal to the price of risk divided by the wage, which is simply the isoprofit curve or the marginal rate of substitution for the firm. And we see that they're both upward sloping, one convex, the other concave in wage and risk space. They do, of course, look different in wage and benefit space, where they're now downward sloping. And I've represented here an isoprofit curve that is a straight line. That may or may not be realistic. I just wanted to show you the difference between the two types. And we have, once again, a point at which this worker and this firm have met. Now, remember... It's rare for the firm to choose to find a new isoprofit curve that they're willing to exist on and employ that worker. The firm is going to be satisfied with their planned level of profit. We're going to presume that that's zero in a competitive marketplace. Certainly, they'd like more. Uh, but they probably can't get more. They can get less profit, but that's detrimental to their long-term health, of course. And it would be the rare firm or the rare worker that is going to be willing to overpay, uh, the, where the firm's going to overpay for a worker, uh, such that it'll put them in a loss position just to get the productivity of that worker. Normally, we're going to be looking at where the workers' indifference preferences, their tastes and preferences, line up with the firm's uh, wage offer, as such that the worker can accept the the wage that's being offered by the firm, and that's going to happen right here where we have this uh, this this tangency, of course. Well, this is our equilibrium condition, and you can suppose if we have an equation that tells us about this marginal rate of substitution or the price of wage divided by the price of benefits, we have an equation that gives us something about the marginal utility of benefits in this case divided by the marginal utility that the worker receives from wage. And again, that's simply their indifference curve in benefit and wage space. If that equals some equation, then we can set the two equations equal to one another because they're both going to include the variables wage and rest, or wage and benefits rather. And we can then identify W star and benefit star in this case, which would be the optimal levels of wage and benefit for the worker that is accepting this job for the firm, which is on the zero profit condition ISO profit curve. Well, let's look at how this might look if we're thinking about one firm with different jobs and how it might look when we're thinking about different firms in the same job. And we'll continue on in wage and benefit space here. This might make this, uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll continue in wage and benefit space so that it makes this a little bit more intuitive for us and so we can differentiate it from wage and risk space that we'll look at uh, in, a, in a moment. So in wage and benefit space, we know that we've got one firm. So that one firm is going to be on their ISO profit curve. It's called this ISO profit zero in wage and benefit space. And if they, if this is a firm with multiple jobs, then perhaps one job For worker type A will be tangent here. So I have benefit level A and wage level A. But for a different job at the firm, maybe there is a different type of worker willing to accept a different combination of wage and benefits. such that we're at worker B, wage B, rather, and benefits level B. So this might be uh, one firm with two different jobs, or it might be one firm with just two different types of workers that are willing to accept a wage that's going to be on the ISO profit curve, so a combination of wage and benefit that's on the ISO profit curve. 
However, this might look completely different if it's different firms with the same job. So let's see what this might map out like. Again, we continue in wage and benefit space. And now we're going to think about uh, different firms but the same job. So if it's different firms, apparently we have perhaps then different ISO profit curves. Perhaps one ISO profit curve for a firm is here. We're going to suppose these all to be at a zero profit. So this is ISO profit for firm A. Here we're going to see ISO profit for firm B. And if they're looking for the same kind of worker qualified for the same kind of job, then we have to think about what does this offer curve end up looking like. An offer curve, again, is the curve on which firms offers and workers requirements are meeting up. Well, we might have an offer curve that's going to look something like this. So this is the same job, presuming the same type of worker that receives this job. And if it's going to take the job at firm B, it's going to require this level of wage and benefits. So I'll call this W and B. But if this job is going to be fulfilled at firm A, it can have this different combination of wage and benefits. I'll call this W prime and benefits prime. This might be the same type of job, which might attract the same type of worker, but because of the, the cost of wages and the cost of benefits at the two different firms, both of which are seeking profit maximization in a competitive market with profits equaling zero or marginal profits equaling zero, we can see that the offer curve looks very different. So one firm and different jobs versus different firms and one job. Let's look at these in wage and risk space to see how they line up, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the dynamics of this offer curve. So in wage and risk space, with one firm and different jobs, again, we have simply one ISO profit curve, but we have different indifference curves, which might be representative of different jobs at the firm, or might be representative of different level or of different workers, different types of workers, which are going to be then attracted to different jobs, of course. Remember that at any point on this ISO profit curve, the firm's profits are constant. And in this case, we've said that they are zero. We're meeting the zero profit condition in a competitive market. But that we have different combinations of wage and risk. Worker X requires a wage and risk of W and R, whereas worker Y requires a wage combination of W prime and R prime. And finally, worker Z requires a wage of W double prime and R double prime. And if we think about these same firm, different jobs, so they're going to be different workers, and they're going to have different preferences. Well, what does this look like if it's different firms and, the, and possibly the same job? Well, different firms in the same job, different firms are going to have different cost parameters, so they're going to have, and they're going to have different risk and wage preferences. So we have three different firms, each with a ISO profit curve, and we're presuming that each of these ISO profit curves are at a profit equaling zero. We know that the profit is constant at any point on the curve, and we see that they are attracting for this job probably different workers that are going to match up with the firm's ability to offer wage and risk or wage and risk remediation. So this is a look at the equilibrium and the offer curve in wage and risk and wage and benefit space as we've continued this discussion of compensating wage differentials. And recall that a compensating wage differential is expressed by the wage difference that a worker accepts if they're going to take a job at a firm with different benefits, different uh, working conditions, different risks, each of which either provides or subtract from some utility the worker receives. And then when we think about wages in this case, we have to also think about total compensation. Wages in this case would be the cash part of the compensation, but the total compensation is going to include something beyond that. Workers receive utility 
from their total compensation package, some of which they get from wages, some of which they get from vacation, some from opportunities for advancement, stock options, retirement plans, uh, seats at the, the old Delta Center, the Energy Solutions Arena to watch the jazz or maybe a concert, opportunities to go out to lunch, uh, where the work, where the firm is picking up the tab. Maybe it's a massage therapist that comes along on a Friday afternoon to relieve some of the stresses, help people get ready for the weekend or whatever it might be. We measure the compensating wage differential in the dollar difference in the wage and we suppose that when there's a negative when there's a, when there's a lesser wage that the worker is receiving some other utility satisfying benefits not measured in wage or when we think that there's a higher wage is offered by a firm then that firm is probably having to offer a higher wage because it offers fewer utility enhancing benefits or maybe even offers some some disenhancements or some risk that causes the, the worker to have some disutility.